Hi there, and welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Podcast. My name is Patrick Francie, and I'm the CEO of the Real Estate Investment Network. In addition to being a business owner, I'm also a real estate investor, I'm a coach, I'm a husband, I'm a very proud grandfather. And along with that, I'm also committed to stretching beyond what I've already achieved and of living a fulfilled life by continuing to make a positive difference in the world. I invite you to join me to listen in on the Everyday Millionaire podcast as I interview and have conversations with seemingly ordinary individuals who have achieved some pretty extraordinary results, whether it be in their life, in their business, in real estate. And it's here where I'm going to delve into the details of their journey, along with the paths they've traveled to get where they are today, and as importantly, where they intend to go in the future. My guests are here to inspire. They're here to help you learn by talking about what's real for them, both in their wins and in their challenges, from the life and the lifestyle they live to the person they had to become along the way in creating and building their financial futures for themselves and their families. Before I begin this episode, I'll start by first thanking you for listening in and for your support and the feedback you provide us on the show, as well as to ask you to please continue to send your comments, your suggestions, or your questions directly to me at CEO at RainCanada.com. That is CEO at R-E-I-N Canada.com. And if you're inclined, please share this podcast with your friends, your family, and with people you know, or perhaps even people you don't know. Rate the show and comment on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or whatever platform you happen to use to listen in. And while you're at it, please follow me on the Everyday Millionaire Facebook page. So thanks again for the feedback you provide us. It's definitely appreciated. Okay, let's get on with this show and have a conversation with today's guest. My guest today, Simeon Papaelius, is a top performing commercial and investment real estate broker who has a strong and very established presence in the GTA. He's the co-founder of REC Canada, which is an award-winning real estate firm. His team consists of 50 multidisciplined brokers who cover residential, commercial, and investment asset classes and transact well north of $350 million a year. He leads with education, world-class training, and is a mentor to his salespeople. Simeon takes pride in his contribution as an advocate to the industry and a champion of its roots and heritage. Over the course of the last 15 years, REC Canada has consistently been one of the top 10 national brokerages. Most recently, REC Canada held the number one spot in the country in most real estate transactions closed. Under Simeon's guidance and mentorship, his team of brokers is considered best in class. His philosophy is of teaching and coaching the principles of a values-based culture and service. He believes at his core that no individual on his team is bigger than the other or the clients they serve. Humility, integrity, and service. That is the formula. So, without any further delays, let's get this show started. Simeon Papaelius, welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Podcast. Thank you for joining me. It's my pleasure, Patrick, to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be part of the roster, man. Thank you. So listen, you know, uh, I've only recently gotten to know you and starting to get to know you. And uh, it came out of me joining you on your podcast. So thank you for that invitation. I hope that uh, your listeners got some good value out of that. And uh, along the way, we started having conversations. And uh, from the RAIN perspective, you also stepped up and said, you know, I want to be part of this RAIN community in a, in a big way, which I was really excited about, by the way. So let's give our listeners a little bit of a background, Simeon, and just who you are and what you're doing right now, uh, what you got going on. And then we're going to start getting uh, down into the layers of uh, how you got there and the journey. Yeah, man, it's um, it's been a crazy life, you know, and uh, it, it's never it's never a simple answer. And I think that's why I personally enjoyed uh, the type of interview that this is uh, when I did get the, the questionnaire from your assistant. And uh, in, in turn, um, my, my assistant went over, you know, what it is about, when it is, etc. I said, OK, well, this is going to be interesting. This is very macro. Uh, it's very high level. It's not about business. Uh, it's very personal. Uh, and, and I haven't done something like this in some time, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I'm actually quite excited uh, to to go down 
kind of uh, Simeon Lane and, and revisit uh, some of those uh, steps that we may be covering today. So uh, I'm excited for this, first and foremost. I look forward to it. And I do like, uh, uh, from the podcast that we did for, for me, which is just a broker-facing uh, value-add podcast, uh, I, I like the, the style of conversation, so I'm very excited for today now. So, so Simeon, I don't know about a crazy life that you describe, but listen, one of the things that I picked up on you that I really like, number one, you're quite gregarious. Uh, I, in behind all that, uh, I would say extrovert, but I know better than to assume that. You could very well be an introvert, although we would never know that talking to you. But what's interesting about you as big and bold, you're a salesy kind of guy, but you're not. You're, you're just got that kind of character, that personality type that is a little bit infectious. You know, you've got that energy. And what I like most about what I've seen and heard from you so far is you're just your values in business and your overarching values on who you are and the relationships that you get into. And that was really impressive. And that's why I'm really having this call. So it's one of the reasons. So I want to know more about your journey. Let's talk about where you are today. You're a broker. You're actually a pretty significant broker in that uh, Toronto GTA area. Is that covering it broad enough? Give me a little bit more perspective. Yeah. So, so I, I, I only because I'm a practicing broker and I don't uh, go around banging my chest about it. I'll get it out of the way quickly because I don't like talking about it. Uh, it's just one of my character, whether it's a, a, a flaw or a, or a bonus, I'm not too sure. Uh, we're Canada's highest transaction team, so not just Ontario, but we're recognized across uh, Canada's biggest real estate organization, which is Royal LePage. Uh, as uh, the number one transacting team in the country, and that's for a few years now in the row. Uh, so getting away from that because I, I just hate that whole broker number one uh, business. Um, I, I'll speak to it because I never want to impress anyone, but I want to impress upon them that we've built a, a true uh, a true firm uh, that's ours, that has nothing to do with uh, brand, that has nothing to do with anything but the, the service and value proposition. Uh, that we value as uh, myself and my partner. I have a partner who is invaluable to me. His name is Jazz Takar. And between, uh, and we had a third partner, and we'll get into that uh, later in this conversation. But uh, myself and Jazz uh, have tremendous values as to how we sell, who we sell to, who we do business with, and, and everything that we've done has led us to this point uh, to have 50 incredible brokers across the entire Golden Horseshoe follow us into bottom battle every day and uh, believe in us, and we believe in them, of course, uh, ha has even cemented those values further, uh, and it makes it almost impossible for us to stray from that because there's just so many people hanging on every word that we say at this point. So it's uh, we've, we've become, uh, we've manifested the, the responsibility and accountability is now full circle where you can, even if I wanted to do something different. I don't have the choice to become a bad person. <laughs> so I don't have the option anymore. So doing the right thing for so long has led us to a point where uh, it's the only thing we can do at this point. Okay, so this is such a great conversation because uh, you know I'm, I'm a values-driven, values-based individual. And uh, you know we can shoot, swap some stories about how I actually got tra off track on that at one point um, and where that bit me in the ass. So I wanna go back to you though. This is such a, a great conversation. I think that more people need to understand about just a, a values-based life and a values-based business. They're actually not two separate things, but they do uh, come together and integrate really powerfully because of you as the owner and CEO partner of your business, uh, who you are as an individual is actually represented in your business. So those values have to be able to cross over. And then the people around you actually have to buy into those values and go, no, I love that. That's who I am as well. Or they have to go away. So having said all that contextually, Simeon, is give me some idea of you know, what are your values? You know, could you give me the kind of what your five values are in life or in business, what that might represent for you? Yeah, and, and just to, to kind of add a tiny bit to the context of what you just said, for, for us, uh, it's not so much as to the clients, partners, colleagues, staff that we attract. It's more of the people that we don't attract. 
So by doing the things that we do, uh, it, you attract everyone, but the specific type of person that knows what we're about will not be here because they know they will never survive it. Mm. They know with conviction that they will never be able to get close to the fire here. You know something, so, so, I, I got just, I, I'm sorry to interrupt because this is such a, a fascinating topic for me, but you just put a, a spin on it that's slightly different and spin's probably the wrong word, but it's, it's a perspective from the other side of it. So in other words, you create values for people to show up, but you're saying true, but really you're creating values that doesn't allow certain people to show up. It doesn't, you know, because they bump into the wall called those values and you can't survive in that environment if you don't honor those in those values. Yeah, let me, let me put it this way. If I'm throwing a party and everything at the party is free, everything, everything at the party is free, the drink, the food, the gift bag, everything is free. Is it possible for a thief to be attracted to that party if everything is already free? <laughs> There's nothing to steal. It's impossible. <laughs> There's nothing to steal. Take it. Sure. So a, a thief is always looking to, to get something that they couldn't otherwise have or are willing to work for. Mm -hmm. We've created a culture and an environment in our business and in our lives where there is full transparency. When I hire brokers, they know the deal. There's only two deals in my firm. There is the deal that you start with and the deal you end up with if you put in work. Mm -hmm. There is no favoritism. There's no breaks. There's no favors. There's no excuses. There's, this is a performance-based business. Life is a performance-based sport, period. If you want to make your bones in this business, you got to work. If you're lazy, you're not going to make it here. If you want to cut corners, you're in the wrong crowd. You want to do this, you want to do that. You're looking for the blue pill, the red pill. We're not, there's no pills here, man. There's no pills. <laughs> it's, it's called grinding and it's called service. So, uh, so yeah, man, from a business perspective, it's easy for me to get into personal. I mean, you'll have to crack me down a bit, but we'll get there too. Well, that's really, really interesting. So, how long have you uh, how long have you been in business now? In, you know, where did you kind of start in your business world, and where are you versus where you are today, Simeon? Uh, I started uh, when I was seventeen. Uh, when I was seventeen, I uh, subleased a kitchen in a bar uh, in uh, Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. Mm -hmm. Familiar with so, that place? Uh, been there many times. Yes, sir. So this is a uh, I, I moved to Canada when I was 15. Um, I was born in Canada. We, my, my family moved back to Greece. 12 years later, 10 years later, excuse me, I was five. I came back when I was five. Yeah, 10 years later, my dad has properties here. He had not done his proper uh, tax planning, meaning that he was taxed as a non-resident and he didn't uh, do the appropriate forms. He gets a letter in the mail, you owe 600K, Mr. Papa Elias. Your building is worth 400K, <laughs> so uh, we're going to be taking your building unless you report uh, to duty kind of thing tomorrow. So my dad picked us all up, ripped back to uh, Rick, ripped back to Red Deer, Alberta when I, when I was 15. My sister was 16. Uh, I did high school in Red Deer. I graduated, and my first venture was, uh, was leasing out a kitchen. We come from the restaurant business my whole life, which is customer service, call it sales, call it what you want to call it, but... Uh, it, it's, uh, I, I, I was born in a pizza bowl. I was raised in a kitchen and, uh, I was washing dishes by 11, running the front of the house by 15. And then I got my own brand new place, uh, at 17 as a kitchen, uh, built that up, uh, sold that entity, uh, and moved to another venture, uh, at, uh, at 18 and a half, uh, just again, right around central Alberta. Uh, I coupled with my dad and build operations in Red Deer, Black Falls, Bentley, Alberta, uh, and uh, under a brand called Piccolo Pizza, which still has uh, two existing locations in Red Deer and Black Falls. Wow. So you come by your entrepreneurial spirit pretty honestly. I mean, you uh, have got your uh, family, your parents, your dad. Uh, did your mom, was she part of uh, the business or was she... Yeah, she was part of the business as well. So you kind of grew up with that whole thought process of being entrepreneurial. 
Yeah, and, and I mean, like, so none of my family, like my, my grandfather uh, owned businesses and like before the war and after the Second World War and um, my, my uncles, so there hasn't been, uh, for my father's side specifically, there hasn't been a single person that ever worked for anyone um, other than uh, our, our own uh, our own businesses, family businesses. Mm. Uh, for my mother's side, uh, probably about half and half. My mother, may she rest in peace. I, I lost my mother a couple of years back uh, to, to cancer. But uh, she taught me like just a, a ridiculous amount. Like my dad was always, I've never seen my dad not work. Uh, but my mother was very uh, important to me from the sense of the teachings. My dad didn't have time for the teachings. It was like sink or swim type thing because he was too busy. My mother took the time to nurture values into into how to handle staff, how to how to how to treat people, to to make people do what's best for you, but what's also best for them to create the win wins. Mm -hmm. Where my father was very much the old traditional slave driving type leader, where you're getting paid to do a job, do your job, or get out of here. Mm -hmm. My mother taught me that honey gets millions of bees. Uh, in the other way, you get nothing at the end. Like mm -hmm. you're always gonna sure, like fear in in uh, in ordering people around will do you nothing. You end up being miserable at the end of the night, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to getting a bottle of vodka sent to your home with a thank you note of how much it meant to them that you accommodated someone and all those things. So I had two very different perspectives to learn from, and both have served me well. Knowing both styles of management have done wonders uh, in my career because I know where I've used each method. Well, to do what you do and to have, you know, the team that you have, the size of the team takes, you know, leadership. You know, it takes somebody who can actually, uh, that people want to follow and who are driven to follow. Now, in the context of being a leader, you've had that experience from your mom, your dad, you got perspective, you learned some or you, you grasp some key concepts and values around it. But is leadership something that you study on a regular basis? Do you do a lot of reading? Do you listen to a lot of audio? Like what's your kind of, in your world, what is it that you do to kind of study leadership, Simone? Yeah, so so I'll tell you, uh, and, and we'll, we'll dive into this. I, I've had uh, my third partner um, who is no longer with us. He passed away in 2017, a gentleman by the name of Simon Giannini. Uh, an extremely charismatic man, uh, an extremely uh, experienced businessman and leader in real estate. Uh, I joined his team uh, when I was 26 years old, 27 years old, I'm 41 now. Uh, so, so he was my second or third year in real estate when I got involved with Sign. Uh, and not only was he a mentor to me, he was a friend to me. And uh, he was uh, a seminar junkie. Like I made fun of him because I come from like, I come from the pizza bowl. You know what I mean? Like we don't got time for seminars, but like let's get cracking. What are you talking about? These philosophies, the Richard, the the the, the Robbins, the, the Tony Robbins, the Grant Cardones. But I, that was just my ignorance and my arrogance mm -hmm. as a young man. Mm -hmm. He was what, 10 years or 13 years uh, older than me, 11 years older than me. So it's like he was old, but he wasn't young. Like when you're 27, you look at a 40 year old, you think they're a little old. Like I know how kids look at me now, you know what I mean? So I, I like I, I know because I was just there, and he, they're talking about these seminars. They're talking about intellectual growth. They're talking about self awareness. They're talking about uh, investing in yourself. They're talking about elevating your mind without judgment and all these things. And all I ever knew was judgment. Mm. How high is my horse? Hmm. How low is your horse? I'm not talking artificial judgment like money. I'm talking about even intelligence. I'm talking about perspective. Like there's only one way. In, in that time of my life, there was only one way to look at things. Do you work hard or not? Because if you don't work hard, you're trash to me. Mm -hmm. I came from workers. Entrepreneurial or not, they, you might as well made them slaves because they didn't know better. Mm -hmm. They did it for themselves, but they were still slaves. They never saw a moment of freedom. Because we're talking first generation immigrant, not third generation. Right. So they're still in the trees. They're in the weeds, let alone to look at a forest. I was the, now the second generation. 
one and a half because like I grew up there. But like I have the advantage of like my mortgage was paid by my dad. My dad's mortgage was paid by no one. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference between my dad and me. There's a massive difference between my kids today and me. Mm -hmm. So, so that arrogance that I once had, when you ask me what I read now, I haven't stopped reading and listening in 10 years. Every single day, my truck is fully lo locked and loaded. I'm listening right now to my five next moves. Oh, uh, Patrick Bet David. Awesome. You awesome love that guy. guy. He, awesome. <clears throat> love his stuff. So good. Awesome. It, it, is, is it groundbreaking and new? The answer is no. But it's one man's perspective of how to analyze data. Yeah. How to look at things. Yeah. Ray Dalio's principles is my Bible. Yeah, there you go. Like, if anybody's looking for a Bible, a Bible to live by, to work by, to grow by, pick up Ray Dalio's book. Because mm -hmm. all it teaches you is all the things he learned. What worked, what didn't work. Shameless. The man will tell you what he did. And if you hear some of the shit this man did, it couldn't be more wrong. The baseball cards, the, the judgment inside, thinking he's doing something open, well, you insulted half the company. Mm -hmm. But he talks about it. Mm -hmm. So, it, so let, let this be the summary of, of do I read? I, I read and I listen every single day. The reason I mentioned my partner is because he believed in Kaizen, which is the never-ending pursuit of growth mm -hmm. and progress. Mm -hmm. Meaning, not perfection, progress, not perfection. Mm -hmm. Chip away. Get that needle moving. It is forever imprinted on the back of the beautiful vessel that we bought together four years ago, a year before he passed. Uh, that We never got to change the name together, but I've smashed a bottle of bubbly when I named the vessel Kaizen. It's at the Toronto Harbor, and it will forever, every time I look at that boat, there's only one man I honor, so, in that mm -hmm. side. Now, Simeon, you know, you're, you're so background is Greek and, and you said what you, you said a lot there. And I'm going to kind of unpack a couple things the way I hear it. But, you know, culturally, and this is my very, very kind of my own story, minimal understanding. But there is in the in, in the Greek culture that there is there's the entrepreneurship, there's business, there's an intensity of that of Greek that culturally is just intense. Is that a fair statement to, to say? Very, very much so. Now, how do you maintain that intensity without, now I want to, why I want to say this in a way that, cause I, mm, let me, let me ask this question. Intensity can be misconstrued as somebody being an asshole. Yet I see your intensity, but there's not anything that I'm picking up that says you're an asshole. So there may have been at some point in your life when you were younger and, you know, kind of more aggressive, more assertive, had a bit of a chip on your shoulder where that judgment was in. So I guess where I'm leading to is the question around this is where did humility start to show up for you? Was it an incident? Was something happened to your life where somebody looked at you and gave you a slap and said, get your head out of your ass? What, what was it for you? What was that evolution for you? Yeah, so, so I will tell you all the, the things that, uh, and I'm not going to speak for all Greeks because that would be dumb in itself. Yeah. But the majority of immigrant Greeks, the majority of entrepreneurial Greeks are extremely intense, as I am very intense. Mm -hmm. The majority of them that's going to come across as an asshole, and that's not limited to Greeks, no, but to extreme, an extreme, overwhelming amount of first-generation immigrants, mm -hmm. the hard workers, it's that hard work entitles them, or they feel entitled to judge, because they're putting in everything, they're willing to die for it, that gives them, or what they believe is the right to judge others. Mm -hmm. It gave me, so you asked me, were you? The answer is absolutely yes. That's what I was referring to. And even though I never made it out, because I, 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 in, in my early 20s, I worked in corporate environments. Uh, of course, even there, I was the fastest promoted entry hire into a senior management position 
ever in the history of that said company because of my work ethic that only breeds more assholeness. Mm -hmm. It only breeds more entitlement that it's proof that if you work hard, and which means everybody else is lazy. Mm -hmm. If you work hard, you can make it to the top quickly. Mm -hmm. So I'm better than you. So in, in, in where I changed, it wasn't a person, it wasn't a circumstance. Uh, it, it, it was me who was lucky enough to meet people uh, that I believed in, that understood meditation, I practice gratefulness every single day, all day, every day. Like if it was 11, 11, I have a ritual because not because 11, 11 is a lucky mumbo jumbo number. It's just a great reminder of synchronicity that I'm going to remember to simply say, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just say, thank you. Stop what you're doing. Say, thank you for one second. Before this podcast, we're, we're talking like the audio, the video, this wasn't working. <laughs> For me and you to complain about something not working, who do we think we are mm -hmm. to deserve that everything needs to be working? Mm -hmm. So humility comes from like people struggle. And when I saw how much people struggle to make everyday decisions, which means they lack the knowledge, they lack the direction, they didn't have the luck that I have to have a, 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 an incredibly engaged and nurturing mother, a father who worked hard and set the examples. Not everybody had that shit. People grow up getting tossed around from home to home. People get, they don't just, we don't all have the same fortune. Mm -hmm. and, and when I realized that, I was 28 years old. Uh, it was when I got married. And it's funny because my wife still to this day will tell you that the man who I married, the man you've become and the man that you're becoming are so polar, polar opposite it's it's incredible, and and I, of course I'm proud of those statements. Mm -hmm. Between being a, being a, a Greek, like we're not talking about racism against black people or homophobia. Everything is on the table because sure. as a Greek, you're you're born to believe that your history makes you entitled to be able to speak a certain way on this planet. Mm -hmm. So so I'm not talking about racist. I've never I was never racist. But did I make ignorant comments as a high schooler when I came to Canada in my early 20s? Right now, one of my one of my partner in my restaurant business is one of the most prominent gay men in the city. And he's in and out of my house like my brother, because he is my brother. Sure. 20 years ago, I would have made a cute remark under my breath. Mm-hmm. Change can only be done on your own to truly believe it, I'm talking. Mm -hmm. Change can only be made by oneself for oneself. You can never pretend, you can't fake it, you can't, you're only fooling yourself and you're creating uh, a disgusting, sick person inside when you're faking it. Change for the right reasons or don't change at all. You know, it's, it's interesting is that, you know, the fundamental difference, you know, when I married my wife 25 years ago, we've been together 30, we just celebrated our 25th uh, wedding anniversary. And, oh, um, and uh, thanks. And so she, you know, she, she used to joke that she uh, married her favorite Neanderthal. And, uh, you know, and I used to joke that, you know, the, you know, a chunk of coal or a diamond is just a chunk of gold that was put under a great deal of pressure. And uh, she was the pressure and she was worth the pressure. And the realization that I had, and I've shared the story many times, uh, which is just simply to say, I would do the things I did or say the things I said, and she would look at me, and this was prior to being married, uh, she would look at me and she'd go, why are you that way? I, why do you say that? And I go, it's just the way I am. And I used to use that as a kind of a common kind of comeback. It's just the way I am. And one day she looked at me and she, and I don't know what the situation was. And she said, you know, it's a choice, right? And it was like, what, what are you saying to me? <laughs> like, you know, so, so she kind of hit me between the eyes with a hammer and the realization that who I'm being, how I'm being, how I'm showing up, belief systems, it just totally opened up the door for me to realize that these are all choices. This is how I view the world, how I want to show up, who I want to be as a man. 
and how I want to be as a dad, a husband, a son. I mean, it just opened up this whole world for me. And I went on my journey of creating who I am in the context of my life. Now, that's an ongoing journey. It doesn't change. But I love mm-hmm. what you said is that, you know, and this is why, you know, I'm so so happy and so proud of my wife and our relationship is because she's been a driving force. We've been a driving force behind each other. But having said that, you know, she's kind of my benchmark. You know, she's like your wife. She goes, who you were, who you who you've become and wh- who you're becoming is something that I love more and more every single day. And but that's just to say and to share with, you know, individuals who might be stuck where they're at is the realization that culturally you had every reason you were brought up in an environment. You were like, you're a product of all of it. But in, unless you make well, a... Well, well, remember, in like Greece, where I grew up, like I grew up in Greece from uh, from five to 15. Those are your formative years. Sure. That's the value installation. That's that's where where it all happens. Uh, Greece is 98% Greek Orthodox. Mm-hmm. So, so if, if we want to talk about intolerance, uh, I, again, I'm not religious. I'm, I'm very spiritual and I don't want to offend anybody religious. Uh, It's not my intent, but I'm not proud of any religious body Mm -hmm. that instills its own values to be right. Right. So I don't care what you are. I'm not speaking to you. Don't look for ways to to, to create the problem that I'm discussing right now. Sure. Because that's not my intention. But as a Greek Orthodox board, and I still wear my cross. Mm Mm-hmm. To this day, this is my baptismal cross. Mm -hmm. It's been on my body since I was a a baby. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is a cultural icon. Do I believe in the value system of God? Absolutely. I don't want to do bad to anyone. But I, I, when I say I feel the exact same way for the Quran, for Buddha, for the Torah, I couldn't give a shit what you believe in. Mm-hmm. Every single one of us has been fully loaded with the principal system wired by the universe to know what's good and bad. Mm-hmm. When I turn around and you take my drink, you knew you took it because mm-hmm. you waited till I turned around. Mm-hmm. When I t- took went for a walk and you scratched my car because you felt a certain way, you know what you did. Mm-hmm. Doesn't you don't need Jesus, Buddha, Mustafa, what else? Please. <laughs> Just, nobody needs Mohammed to tell them anything. Yeah. So again, like, this is a value system that was instilled in us hardwired by the universe. Mm-hmm. We all stand by it since the beginning of time. Before us, for the tens of thousands of years of civilization before us, there was 15 gods and 30 gods and 60 gods, all good to me. We all know what's wrong and what's right. And when you were saying it's a choice, when your wife said it's a choice and a bell went off in your head, I'm talking about the very same bell. Yeah. What the hell am I saying right now is what I said to myself. But mm-hmm. what is the purpose that I'm serving? Mm-hmm. To crack a joke? Be quiet. You don't need to make a joke. Mm-hmm. At somebody else's expense. Mm-hmm. Why make a joke at somebody else's expense? Be quiet, man. Smile. But that's training. That's number one, that's training. Number two, that's a huge awareness because it is easy given just culturally groups that you may hang out in. That becomes, I share, I'm going to share a really quick story that speaks to this, which I think is so kind of meaningful. This goes back to the the amazingness of my wife. And I was at a, in a, a Christmas party with her in a particular group. Uh, and this happened to be a group of hockey executives, uh, very high end hockey executives. And they were talking about people that weren't there. And they were then talking about the general manager and uh, two or three of these executives and said, made some comment about it. It was, there's only a dozen people there. And uh, Stephanie was within this executive. And uh, they said to her, they said, Stephanie, and I didn't, oh, by the way, I had never really met this group and I'd never been invited to this particular clique. Anyways, long story short, they said to Stephanie, they go, so Stephanie, what do you think? And ha ha ha. And she, she literally stood up, said to 12 people, she said, he's not here to defend himself. This is all gossip. I'm leaving. And I'm sitting there drinking hand going, What just happened? And she's walking to the door, putting on her shoes. 
And I'm going, uh, I guess we're leaving now. Uh, see everybody. But it was all, it was one of the most awkward <laughs> moments for me. And one of the, I guess, in hindsight, you know, it was one of the proudest moments. And uh, it, it made a statement for number one, who she is. And she's always been that way. She has a no gossip policy, uh, always has had. But it also made a statement to that executive. And by the way, uh, that executive came back uh, later on to commend her for the stand she took. And they looked at themselves and went, you know something? That was really, really unprofessional. It did uh, totally dishonored our, our particular general manager. And so thank you for that. But that takes a freaking... That, that, that takes balls, but yet that's kind of where that awareness, that training comes from, I guess, is what I'm saying here, Simeon, is that you, you've you got that. Like, you're that guy. You know, you you stand so, up that I, way. I, but I'll take it to the level, like, and I try every day. And by, by no means am I perfect. I, I see the stupidest shit all the time, and I catch myself later. But, like, just right now, we said it takes balls. It's as simple, and when I say a choice, and when I say awareness— it's as simple as every day making a stride to stop saying uh, having balls and saying having the courage because our daughters are watching. Yeah. Because we're trying to change. And when True. I say we're not perfect, I'm not here to correct you. Mm -hmm. That's not my role here because I have already probably said it twice without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is culturally growth in progress, Kaizen, is us being able to have a conversation and being able to pick apart without offending, without bringing somebody down, because the right reason is when my daughter is looking at me, because when I go home in an hour from right now, she's going to run to the door, like, exactly like the dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the dog runs to the door to see the owner come in. Well, so do my kids. Yeah. They're screaming from the other end of the house, Daddy! Yeah. What comes out of my mouth next mm -hmm. is what gets burned into the hard drive. Mm -hmm. Every day. So true. So to bring this back to business, it takes all but one second. When I walk in the office at 8.30 every morning, there's a guy who started three months ago that does not know me. There's a person that's been there for 10 years that knows me and may have an issue with me. Mm -hmm. There's a guy who's been here for five years, a girl that just got in a fight with her husband two minutes ago, somebody whose mother just died, somebody who we don't know. Mm -hmm. we don't know the only thing we do know is what we control and that's this mouth right here mm -hmm. these thoughts right here mm -hmm. the things we say break bones the tongue doesn't have a muscle but it's the only thing that can break savagely mm -hmm. so true destroy people so true our mind has to be strong meaning that when people say things to us do I walk in and every day it's roses? The difference is I don't give a shit anymore. My skin has grown so thick that I have confidence in myself, my family, my team, my colleague. Nobody can touch me anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Whatever problem comes, I'll deal with it. I'll find a way. I no longer get shook. You can't shake me. Say something to me right now that you found out the craziest thing. I don't give a shit. I'll stop. I'll say, Patrick, stop. Stop. What is the problem? Mm -hmm. Stop. What happened? Slowly, amicably, logically, strategically. I told you I'm listening to my five next moves by, by David Pet, Bet Patrick. Yeah. But, sorry. David Pet <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Bet David. <laughs> Who has three Love first it. names for a living? Anyways, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm listening to that in, in, on Audible right now in my truck. And one after the other, all he's asking people to do is stop, think. Mm -hmm. What was the cause of the problem? Mm -hmm. Did you put it on the board? Did you visualize it, talk about it, get a third opinion, not a second, a second and a third opinion? What did you do to think that you deserve a better outcome if you didn't put in the work to identify the problem? Mm -hmm. So the way you treat your child when you walk into the house the way you embrace your wife when you walk into the house in front of your children. Do my kids know that me and my wife scuffled last night? Do they deserve to know? Some people might walk into the house and blow their wife out. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think my son and daughter think of that now? Mm -hmm. Is this how, what they're going to do when they grow up? Same thing. 
If I do the same at my work, if I walk in, my director of operations, Bobby, who I love to, to, to the death, you don't think he's done things to piss me off? Of course. If I walk in and blow him out, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. What example am I setting to my other staff? Mm-hmm. If I can be so short-tempered, what a loser. Mm-hmm. When all I have to do is ask, why did you miss that email last night? Laura's dad was sick and we have to run to Cambridge. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Did I ask or did I just come in and, and go off? Well, I guess that's always assuming that the people that you're dealing with that may have uh, messed up were are actually, they're doing their best and they always come from the best intentions. And, you know, when you take that approach as to assuming that they were lazy, assuming that they uh, were trying to rush things, uh, it, it is easier uh, to approach what the actual issue really is and then and and get that. I want to go off on a little bit different. I mean, we could talk about this for a long time because I think it's such an interesting conversation. But I, I, I for me, it is. Uh, but I want to ask you this. When you talk about what you're doing in business right now, you've had a great deal of success. You're uh, hitting it out of the park. When you look in, and because you used Patrick Bet David as, as a, a bit of a, you know, one of the books he wrote or Ray Dalio. I mean, those guys have achieved, you know, a lot of things. Now, when you think about what your goals are or what you want to achieve, how much of is it is money driven versus something else? You know, it's easy to say one of my goals is to have a billion dollars in the bank or a hundred million in the bank or to own a hundred doors. How are you wired? What is it? What is driving you? Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult question to ask me. Um, it's, I, I'm not going to say uh, obsessed or and compare that to passionate. Uh, I'm not going to go down any of the cliches. Uh, I'm not money-driven at this point. Uh, I used to be money-driven. Mm-hmm. I've made more money than I ever dreamt that I would make. Um, so, so from a money perspective, not that I'm sitting on millions, because I never even fathomed that that would be a reality uh, for me. Because mm-hmm. I know where I come from. And uh, I'm not talking about ancient history. My grandparents had two houses blown up by bombs, then by fires, then by civil war. So, like, everybody comes from a different place. Sure. Maybe if I was a third-generation Anglo-Saxon in Canada, I would have a different goal system because I would have three generations before me, uh, you know, making the the yeast for the bread. Mm -hmm. I, I saw the yeast get blown out twice with near bankruptcy. So I have a very different approach to life, a unique one. So my goals and obsessions now or, or passions or whatever we want to call them uh, are not money driven. I've already achieved uh, more than I thought I would have money wise. Uh, I'm definitely addicted to growth. Mm-hmm. I love growth. I love uh, business development um, all the opportunities, but on the same token, because I don't know, maybe I'm delusional. And what I mean by that is all the growth opportunities that are coming to me are so significant and so incredible, and they're tied to significant amounts of money mm-hmm. uh, and impact, of course. But I still think that in the back of my mind, uh, I may be money driven and I'm just in denial. But it's growth. So, like, I'm just answering this, like, I'm talking honest from the heart. Sure. It's growth that I love. It's organic growth that I love, meaning that uh, a relationship with your firm can only bring growth. Mm -hmm. Growth. But if growth is measured in dollars, not in impact of lives. So, unless we change our metrics in the forefront Mm -hmm. to be able to look at a different metric, it's still tied to money. So I'm still going to say it's tied a bit to money, mm-hmm. but it's growth, strategic growth that I'm addicted to. Mm-hmm. Strategic growth. It's an interesting kind of question. I don't often ask the question of, you know, do you have a definition or how do you define success? I actually try not to use the word success. I, I think it's too, uh, I don't know what the word, it's too 
it's it's a wrong word. It's a word it's style. a vague word. You know, like it's just so vague. What does that mean? You know, uh, well, well, it's about money. You know, if I have lots of money, then I'm successful. Really? What about the other six areas of your life? You know, so for me, what I've come to understand, and I share this with you, is that. I've given this a lot of thought, you know, is what drives me and ultimately what drives me and what I, you know, I'm on the, I, I joke about it, but it's true. I'm on the, you know, the Freedom 95 plan because, you know, for me, uh, money, I've, I've made a lot of... I've heard 65, 75, and 85. You just, you crossed the line. <laughs> well, my mom is 93 and is still sharp as a tack. So, you know, I've got good genes. But the, the point is, is that, you know, it isn't, I've made a lot of money. I've, I've, I've screwed up and it's cost me a lot of money and, you know, and all of it in there. And, and in between all of that, what I'm driven by is being a contribution. I know that one of the requirements of humans is, and the human nature is to have significance. And I know that my significance doesn't live on my podcast or being on stage or doing those kind of public things I do, it's really about contribution. And I can be just as happy to have amazing one-on-one -on -one conversations where I make a difference, which I do on a, on a regular basis, as, as I am on a stage in front of 400 or 800 or whatever people or on a podcast. The point is this, is that if I can make a difference in somebody else's life, that lights me up. And that's what keeps me going. And, you know, so that's in my world, that's kind of uh, why I do business. That's why I love the Real Estate Investment Network. Number one, I get to run a business that is a contribution to the success of others. The financial success, yes, but I can't even tell you how many Ray members over the years, uh, they own a little bit of real estate, not a lot, but the difference was in being in the community, uh, taking it on and being a contribution back to the community. and. And so these are the lessons I've learned along the way. And then so, Simeon, the reason that, you know, one of the things that kind of in, in our previous conversations and even in this conversation, there's a part of that that drives you, whether with your team or the clients of your team, of your business, it's kind of what keeps you going. Is, is that a fair comparison or statement? No, it's, it's a very fair comparison. And I also think, and that ties back to ego, of course, as always. Because success, the word sucks. Happiness also sucks because there's so many things that contribute to happiness. How do you measure uh, it? Yeah. I, I think balance is a much better word. Uh, a balanced approach to oneself, meaning that you can't compare your life to mine because you're not me. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what's balanced to you is going to be a different that's what's balanced to me. Mm -hmm. And I still, to this day, I was born in 1980. I'm 41. And I, I'm going to tell you with absolute certainty that balance is still an area that I struggle with dearly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm still uh, outweighing my uh, my goal is to be 50-50, meaning my family and my and myself personally, like my actual, my exercise, my meditation, my children, my wife, my home, my dog, get 50% of me. Mm -hmm. And my business gets 50% of me. Hmm. It's still, I would still call it an 80-20. It's something that I've been working on forever. Mm -hmm. It's something that I'm going to continue to work on until I get it. Mm -hmm. I'm better because I've learned how to delegate. I've learned how to let go. I've, I've let go. Of, I've made vast improvements and I know it. But I have a ways to go because if I... It all starts with pretending you're okay with it until you convince yourself you're okay with it, and then you're eventually okay with it. Mm -hmm. So delegation was a big thing for me. Mm -hmm. Big, big thing. Letting go of control was mm -hmm. a very big thing for me. Mm -hmm. But that's done as well. So the biggest, most frightening ones are out of the way. Mm -hmm. Creating efficiencies is where I'm at. Systematizing and processing everything that I do is where I'm at. Uh, to make myself scalable, where me saying that, oh, I need a clone, I don't think that's cute. No. I think that's sad. Yeah. I don't need a clone. Mm -hmm. I need a better process. Mm -hmm. I need better people. Yeah. I need more people. Yeah. That's what I need. So, mm -hmm. so it, it's recognizing without allowing your ego to say that I need a clone because it's not funny. It's not joking. 
you're saying it because you feel it. Like when I when I was walking up the elevator today, I said to Bobby, you know, we've been making media all day today. I haven't gotten into anything. I wish I could pause time for eight hours and restart the clock. Mm-hmm. That is as shameful as it can be. Because why didn't I tell Bobby and two other people what to do before we got started so I don't put myself in an anxiety attack after this podcast is recorded? Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting. There's a lot in that, you know, and, and uh, I've been in business 37 years. Yeah, I'm 63 years old. I've learned some things along the way. And, you know, the fundamental thing about you're talking about, which goes back to balance, and it's a really important conversation because I, I'm i going to give you my view of balance because I know that listeners and viewers, this is I have these conversations on a regular basis. So I, I share a, a, a perspective that may give you a different view of the world. You know, when you talk about, you know, as a CEO of your business, you know, having people around you is also about scaling your business. You need to do that, right? It also, it, it limits, it's part of risk mitigation. Having a good executive team is really important. But back to the balance of life. So I break life into seven different areas of life. My physical, my mental, my emotional, my spiritual, my financial, and my vocational. And I know I'm missing one, uh, just doesn't pop into my mind. So, you know, at any given time, which one of those buckets are being neglected? Okay. Oh, health. That was the seventh one. So, you know, what, what am I neglecting at any given time? So, is, for example, if I'm going through, you know, some uh, financial challenges, uh, that could be a lot of pressure, but it doesn't mean the rest of my life is crap. The rest of my life is like freaking awesome. I just happen to have some financial pressures, you know, or or maybe I'm uh, not paying as much attention to my health as I am my vocation. But here's the big thing that I've learned, and I want to give you a consideration for it. You've got a young family, and so it's, you know, I can't pretend to be in your space of what you may carry in terms of your load of how you feel about with your family. But first thing that I know is that I never get out of bed ever. Like I'm saying ever. So I can, I ever say never say never and never say always, but I can say never is that I love what I do. My wife loves what we do. It's we're never going to work. I remember years ago, a young man came up to me uh, after being on stage and I did a presentation. He goes, gosh, Patrick, how many hours a week do you work? And I went, I don't even know what to say to that. I I'm like 24 seven, you know, I know. <laughs> right. So I can't make that wrong because I love what I do. I love growth. I love contribution. Now, having said that, I then have to examine. I have to examine my over, overarching life and say, how does that fit in? And how do I create my business to support that? So it's not that or that. It's my business is my life and my life is my business. That's how I look at it. And I'm not saying I'm right. This is just a philosophy. And you know, 100%. my daughter's part of it or my wife is part of it or, you know, whatever it is. And in to some regards, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, think about your dad running the pizza, the, the, the pizza shop. Everybody's it's all hands on deck. Everybody worked. Now, that was kind of an extreme part of it. But where's the fun in that? You know, and so we create and we work fun into the businesses, you know, and yes. so then recreation, dude, you know, I've interviewed you a couple of times, both times you're on your boat. So yes, you're working, but gosh, you're having some fun too, right? <laughs> so, so my point is, is that uh, I don't think there is such a thing of balance. I think the, the, the challenge that people face is the guilt they carry because they think there should be balance. And I'm going to be honest with you, I've never met anybody that has this thing called balance. It just doesn't exist. On any given day, at any given time, your view of the world is going to mean you're out of balance. And I know some pretty successful individuals uh, worth many millions of dollars and big, bold, gregarious businesses and individuals, and there's no such thing. But they love their life. I'll tell you what. I, I don't know... If you're trying to take me out on a date or not, but you're making me feel better. Um, <laughs> uh, and the reason you're making me feel better is because what you're saying is true. Uh, and, and maybe, and some maybe, because I was I was saying it in this way. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. And again, like, this isn't, uh, I don't think we're putting a therapy session onto the audience, but I think this is what people really need to consider 
Uh, when you're trying to make moves in your business, business and life, this is so what we have true right now, uh, Patrick, is the fact that both of us look at life and business as one. Mm -hmm. It's not two different things. No. You are you identify it's the guilt you carry to do certain things that you're not doing versus other things that you are doing. And I still am giving too much of myself to tasks, not people. There you to go. Tasks that I shouldn't be. Great realization. That's the realization of every CEO, by the way. That's the realization that every CEO has to come to, you know? But you brought, but you brought this up, mm -hmm. and this is why I'm thankful. This is why I feel better right now, mm -hmm. is because you generated a comment that this wasn't about balance, it's about guilt. Mm -hmm. this, isn't about, this isn't about who I'm spending time with. Me spending time with you right now is exactly where I want to be. Mm -hmm. This is exactly where I want to be. This makes me complete this makes me happy i want to be here mm -hmm. but when i'm doing emails and checking emails after this mm -hmm. that's the mistake that was the that what i looked over i didn't do things right today and it's gonna cost me today right totally. so better more efficient management and thought mm -hmm. is we just need to be better mm -hmm. what do we value mm -hmm. could be anything what do we value what do we do? Mm -hmm. Better decision. That's it. That's it. You know, the thing about this conversation, Simeon, is that it is, uh, it, yeah, you know, I think people listen to a podcast to pick up what they pick up, but these are lessons that everybody can learn. You know, I've been in business 37 years. I'm still learning shit. You've, you've been very successful. You're 40, just over 40 years old. You hit it out of the park. You're learning stuff as you go. And this is just, to me, a way for people to speed up their learning process, if you will, you know, to look and reflect. And, and I can't tell you how many times in over the years and, and all the coaching that I've done and all the conversations that I've had, that people are, they carry that load of, ah, I'm just not in balance. I should be home. I should be doing. And that's great. So work backwards from that and then put in those corrections. And if you don't know how to put in those corrections, that's when you reach out to that mentor, that guide. I wanted to, I want to ask you something here on this as well, because, you know, you've got with your team and I know the nature of your business as a broker and as realtors is like, it's, it can be 24 seven, depending on what you want to do. But, you know, your team, you're providing leadership. Are you one of those, um, a CEO taught me many years ago, very, very successful, like huge, you know, a billion dollar company and happened to be able to have an audience and bullshit with them. And, you know, he recommended a book that it, good to great. He's actually in that book. But the, one of the things that he told me is that as a CEO, he's not really a CEO. This is his style, by the way. He wasn't saying everybody should be this way, but he was a coach and he actually coached. That was his, that was what he wore as the CEO of his company. He was giving guidance. He was helping people get through their shit. Are you built that way or how do you work with your team in that regard? Is it like, quit making excuses, get your ass out the door? Like, is it like, and I'm not saying that, that I'm, I'm giving an extreme example. Yeah. How yeah. is it with you? So, so, so my, my podcast name is called Broker's Playbook. Mm -hmm. uh, sports analogies are very much uh, <laughs> uh, within my wheelhouse. So yes, uh, I, I do believe in coaching. I do believe in mentorship. Um, not only do I, I coach my team, like today's Friday, it's, it's, uh, it's team meeting day at 11 a.m. this morning. Um, I had um, uh, two dozen of, of my team uh, on a call where we were talking about accountability, about things that I, I put out to be done last week. Video is overwhelming. Content creation is an overwhelming task for many, but in real estate, it's necessary um, I've told my team that the meeting is typically 80%, uh, three years in the business or less. My, all my seniors are too busy to attend the team meeting. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, it's uh, Friday. Is a, Listen, the people who need to be there are there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do hold people accountable, mm -hmm. meaning like I ripped everyone from top to bottom today, ripped everybody from top to bottom that if they didn't do it, why didn't you do it? And then I beg them and reminded them how much love and faith I have in them. Mm -hmm. That the only person to benefit from everything that I'm saying is them, not me. Mm -hmm. So I do take a very nurturing, a very coaching, a very 
uh, active approach to mentorship. Mm-hmm. Mentorship, again, like we've spoken to to my mentor, uh, who who is in heaven today, but uh, I speak to him about him with uh, with my entire soul. Uh, into every mentor that I've had living, even my part, my business partner is my mentor. You're my mentor. Um, I've gotten so many nuggets out of today you would never know. Mm. Um, and ones that I already expressed that I got out of today. But um, I approach coaching that way. I also believe in mentorship in a big way, meaning that um, I'm very actively involved in what's called the Prince's Trust, uh, which is an organization founded by uh, Prince Charles uh, in Britain. Uh, it is for veterans. Uh, that family does a lot for veterans, the, mm. the, the monarchy does. Uh, and this is an organization that I coach veterans that have come back and are looking to start a business. Uh, so principles of entrepreneurship, principles of marketing, principles of budgeting, principles of staffing, employment, management, uh, all the things that you need to get started. Uh, I'm literally in my sixth month of coaching Topside uh, Brewery out of Nova Scotia. Mm. Uh, a tremendous man, Mr. Uh, Captain uh, Blair Tobin, uh, a Navy vet. And he started a brewery and we're in our sixth month of coaching there. And he's doing absolutely incredible. But there's so many ways to contribute. And your coaching style, going back to are you a coach? Are you, what kind of leadership uh, style do you have? encouraging somebody to move but keeping them accountable like you can't get away with everything or else it's not mentoring then you're humoring someone Mm -hmm. so you can't people you can't allow people to get away with not doing the work like if i hire a trainer tomorrow buddy tells me to do 20 push-ups 10 burpees five setups and I don't do them. And he says, it's okay, Simeon. Let's go for a cheeseburger. <laughs> well, fuck. Sorry, excuse my French. He didn't do me a favor. No. He wasn't nice to me. He mm-hmm. let me down. Mm-hmm. He failed me. He wasn't nice. He wasn't a friend. He wasn't nurturing. He failed me. Mm-hmm. I agree. That's it's where he simply needs to say, Simeon, I know that the tenth burby is going to be impossible, mm-hmm. but I need you to do it because I know you can do it. Mm-hmm. Because you have two legs, two arms, and a core. Mm-hmm. And if, if if you just get up and do it, you'll do it, mm-hmm. and then you'll know that you did it. You know, one of the things about uh, coaching and 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 understanding is that often a coach knows more about what we're capable of than what we know about our own selves. And the one thing that as a coach that I will say to somebody is, I can't want something more for you than you want it for yourself. And that sometimes is the issue that shows up. So, you know, being coachable is a really important part of what we need to understand and what we need to do. So we go back to the conversation is around being coachable. And uh, did you, do you think you needed to learn to be coachable yourself? Uh, you know, you came away. I, I know it's one thing to say, well, I listened to my mom. Uh, but then it's, you know, you've got that kind of young, cocky attitude like many do. Was there a point where you said, you know, I, I realized that, gosh, you know, why am I telling my coach I can't do this? Why am I telling my coach they're wrong? Uh, did, did you have any of those kinds of scenarios? Uh, I, I truly did it. Uh, coachable is one thing. So uh, it, it's who I took advice from. Again, in my early 20s, I was far more arrogant, but I was always coachable. I did play sports uh, growing up. I, I played soccer as a kid. I played American football when I moved to Canada. Uh, and and uh, I, I just always respected. Uh, I always had smart people around that I respected. Mm. So I think that helped. Um, I was never the smartest man in the room. And I still very much believe in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's what my biggest advice to people is if you're the smartest people in a room, get the hell out. You're in the wrong room. Yeah. Get the hell out. Yeah. Uh, surround yourself with people who will challenge you, who will, who will question you, yeah. who will contribute to you. They care for you. Uh, no, I mean, I, I've been coachable always. I'm more coachable than ever today yeah. where I actually seek, like I, I have a, a thirst. I die to, to find out more. Like I look for things in our conversation right now that I can take away things from. 
Mm-hmm. I look for it. Yeah, it's great. I'm built that way as well. So uh, as we start to wind down, and there's a couple questions I want to sneak in that uh, are more just about a view of the world. You know, one of the common questions is, as you sit here at 41 years old today, what would you give, you know, it's a common question. What would you give your 18 year old self as advice when you look at back on that? The biggest advice is uh, judging character, man. Like I, I've been very optimistic, positive and trusting my whole life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have paid the price for it, uh, for not being a more critical thinker. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would advise my 18 year old self to have more patience, meaning to, to not trust somebody off the bat, to not like, I always believe that people have the best intentions. Mm. I do. Uh, and, it, and I couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. And again, I don't want to justify anyone's fears that hold them back by saying this, but there's a tremendous amount of evil in the world, of people who want to take, of people that... I think that's... Let me use those words. There's far more takers than there are givers in the world. Uh, so So true. It seems that way, doesn't it? It, let me put it that way because it's not too negative because I don't want to give people who are cynics a crutch <laughs> because everything that I've that I've accomplished in my life is because I took a leap mm-hmm. and I trusted the the man next to me the woman next to me mm-hmm. have I paid the price for it sometimes yes my advice to my 18 year old self I repeat would be to be a little bit more critical thinking. Mm-hmm. And to have far more patience to do analysis before I shot the weapon. More discerning character. Very good. Okay, so I got a little bit uh, a more a, a little tougher question, I think. So the question is this, Simeon, and I want you to lean forward and speak into the mic when you give me an answer on this one. And that is, what advice would you give your sixty-five-year-old self? Whew. It's Isn't a curveball. I know. I know it's a curveball. Well, I'm going to tell my 65-year-old stuff, even though what you've told me about balance, I'm going to take it back and not take your advice. I'm going to tell my 60, because you're 63. Yeah. And you're still doing exactly what we're doing right now, which means that you're literally living the reality of life is life, and you do in your life what you want to do. So I understand exactly what you're doing. Mm-hmm but you're only two years from 65 and you look great. And that means that it's going to feel like it's tomorrow. I know it because I'm 41 and I knew 25 was yesterday. Mm -hmm. So taking those assumptions quickly, because this is a curveball. I know nobody's ever asked me this before. I don't normally ask this question. I saved it specifically for you, I guess. Okay. So my, my advice and my order to my 65-year-old self is to shut her down. Go to Greece, four months out of the year, house on the hill. My 65-year-old uh, self will know which house I'm talking about. We're blessed in that to have quite a bit of real estate right now. House on the hill, shut her down, four months. You've done what you've done. Pick it up and breathe. Beautiful. That's my advice. Beautiful. Because I don't trust. Because I don't trust myself, Patrick. <laughs> I'll be grinding. I'll be grinding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do a little rapid fire as we uh, bring this thing home. So uh, these questions are uh, not always that rapid fire, but it's still as fun to do from my perspective. Android or iPhone? iPhone. Okay. Have you always been an iPhone guy? No, I actually, I, I answered iPhone because in September I'm switching. I've been Android for 20 years. Yeah. I'm switching to iPhone with conviction in September. Okay, great. So um, I switched and uh, no regrets, but it's not all it's cracked up to be. That's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you have a favorite quote that you use? If you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, pick a friend. I like that. Go together. I've never heard that one before. Interesting. Favorite tune? Favorite song? Do you have one? Uh, it's a Greek song called uh, Droplet. Is there it's, a uh, theme about it that you like about it? Yeah. It, it, it speaks to uh, uh, of how small 
our little life is like a drop in the ocean, but the impact that one ripple can have can be can change the world. Got it. And that is so true, isn't it? Favorite book. Now you mentioned the five next your five next moves, so you can't mention that one. What's your uh, what's your favorite book that you've read or one that you often recommend or gift? My favorite book of all time, uh, so I'll just break this in two. In business, by far, I, I call it the Bible. It's Principles by Ray Dalio. Mm-hmm. I've read it twice. I've listened to it twice. From a, a, a regular novel type book, uh, I would say uh, Victor Hugo, the athlete. What is it called? Um, Victor Hugo's The Desperate. Okay, well, we'll check it out. We'll check it out. It has to be the most famous book of Victor Hugo of all time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not going to take a sorry. guess on it. I think I know what you're talking about, but I don't know the title either. Either The Degenerate or The... <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. It's it's based in France in the, in the 1760s, 1700s. But it's a tremendous book. If heaven exists, what do you want to hear God say when you get to the gates? Welcome. What's something you do that you don't like doing, but you do it anyways because you're good at it? Nothing. Nothing. I, I like everything I do. At this point in my life, everything I do is something I take great pleasure in. Your room, your desk, or your car? What do you clean first? My room. I'll never sleep in a dirty room. Okay. Never. See? Lots of times I get the answer of uh, my car. You know, so listen. I'll, I'll never drive a dirty car either. <laughs> in my mess. <laughs> and my desk is top shelf too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, keep, I have a tight I keep a tight game Patrick I keep a tight game okay what's your favorite swear word the F word you're an F bomber eh me too most of the time and the final question what are you grateful for today I'm grateful that after an entire day behind these bright lights I have shared such depth with a new friend. I was able to get my business partner the one email he needed just before Bobby left. I spent time and bought lunch for two 16-year-old interns, high school, unpaid interns that are here looking at us in the eyes, cannot believe what they're seeing. Grateful for my children this morning where they had a most fabulous morning with their dad. And I got my pool balanced at home after a chemical <laughs> charade in the last two weeks. Uh, today has been a today has been a wonderful day. Today has been a, gr- a tremendous day. Fantastic. Well, I am so grateful uh, that you joined me on the show today. I'm always, always grateful for my guests that come in because uh, there's time you take out of your day. Uh, the stories you share, the insights you share. I'm always grateful for that, as I know our listeners are. And uh, like you, you know, it's it's funny thing about pools. They're great, but sometimes they're just a pain in the ass. But uh, I, <laughs> I, I got some things handled with my pool today, so that's great. But most of all, I am just grateful for this uh, platform, uh, the team that supports me in uh, making this all come to ha- uh, come together and uh and Simeon, so, so grateful for uh, you joining me today. So thank you very much. My only message is uh, to whoever watched this, to whoever chose to be with us for this time, to listen to us. I hope that our voices bring you solace, bring you good things, that we are a force for the good in your life. Uh, and I send you love. I send you gratitude, Patrick. I send you gratitude for having me on. And I send you all my best energy and all my best thoughts always. Thanks, man. Thanks for joining me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. If you found value in the podcast, please take the time to rate and review and share with others. Share with your friends. As it is my goal to always improve and to provide the highest value for you, the listener, If you have any comments, suggestions, or questions you'd like answered, please email me at ceo at raincanada.com. That's ceo at reincanada.com. I look forward to hearing from you. And until next time, Patrick out.